Bugünün ana konuşmacısını davet edeceğim az sonra. Fakat bu arayı vermeden önce bir şey hatırlatmıştım. Onun tekrar altını çizmek istiyorum. Design Week Turkey'nin hazırlıkları çok uzun zaman alıyor. Siz de takdir edersiniz ki 3 gün sürüyor ve Türkiye'nin en büyük, en kapsamlı tasarım etkinliği. Sadece Türkiye sınırları içerisinde kalmıyoruz. Sınırlarımızı genişletiyoruz, uluslararası konuşmacılar da davet ediyoruz. Ve aslında size soruyoruz, bu sahnede tasarım başlığı altında kimleri görmek istersiniz? Yaptığımız ankette en üst sıralarda çıkan isimlerden birini davet edeceğim az sonra. Pek çok prestijli tasarım ödülünün sahibi. İnsan davranışı odaklı çalışmalarında mühendislik, kullanıcı deneyimi gibi farklı konuları bütünsel tasarım yaklaşımı ile bir araya getiren, BMW, Nike, Pepsi, Samsung, Herman Miller gibi markaların tasarımlarında imzası olan, tasarım girişimcisi ve yaratıcı ajans Layer'ın kurucusu kendisi. Aslında onu e, tasarımlarından da e, çok yakından tanıyoruz. Mesela 3D yazıcıda e, yarattığı tekerlekli sandalye desem herhalde hepinizin aklında bu kişi şekillenecek. Bir not daha son 15 dakikasını Q&A bölümüne ayırabilirim diyor. Eminim ki ona soracak çok şeyiniz olacaktır. Son 15 dakikasında sorularınızı hazırlayın. Eğer prezentasyonunu erken bitirirse sizlerin sorularına da yer verecek. O zaman büyük alkışlar ana konuşmacımız için gelsin. Kocaman alkışlar Benjamin Hubert geliyor. Hi, Hello, you. how are you? Good, thanks. How are you? you? I'm very well, thank you. Are you ready? I think so. And here is our audience, and here we go. Thank you for coming. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Um, I wish I spoke Turkish, then I'd understand what the introduction was about. So I'm going to give you my own little introduction um, before I talk about Leia. Um, I think it's important to introduce myself. So I'm Benjamin Hubert. I'm the founder and creative director of Leia. Uh, Leia is a strategic design agency in London. Um, I'm also creative director and founder of a tech brand called Noli, which I'll talk about later. But we're going to sort of go through um, a big range of projects today. So 12, 13, 14 projects. Some of them I'll go deeply into. Some of them I'll just touch on. Um, but before we pick up the layer story, before we talk about the projects, I just want to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, so from the beginning, I come from very, very humble um, origins. My, my father was a carpenter in construction. My mom was a nurse. Um, but I was pushed into kind of cultural like museums and art galleries and started art very, very young. And then obviously, as you learn through school and university, I understood that actually I was very practical-minded. practical, practical minded. So I like solving problems. I like creating beautiful things, but also solving problems. Um, but actually, one of the most important steps before I took up the Layer studio is my experience in working in other studios. So I worked in three or four quite big industrial design and strategy studios in and around London. I did this for three or four years. And while I was doing that, I was in the basement of my apartment making prototypes of furniture and lighting and objects. Most of them were pretty bad. And I look back and I was like, I can't believe, I can't believe I spent that much time in a basement spray painting something. But what it allowed me to do was two things. The experience of working in other agencies, big agencies, taught me to be robust, taught me to be able to work hard, long hours, focusing on trying to make a product better. Um, I could never have done and set up the studios I have without that experience. Um, but the other thing it taught me is that I wanted to find my own style. So in a way, 
what I'm going to talk to you about today combines my background and my experience with some of my personal points of view of what I believe is good design. Before I set up Leia, I had a studio under my name. So Benjamin Hubert was a studio for five years after the previous experience. Very small, very boutique, three, four, five designers working with um, furniture, lighting, accessory brands. Basically, because they're the types of projects you can do quite accessibly. You know, you can develop them in a shorter time. They don't rely on lots of technology and lots of complexity. And we did this for about five years for the likes of Capellini and Poltrona Frau and, you know, Moroso and some of these companies. So we come on to Leia. So Leia was set up three years ago. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you for about, let's say, 45 minutes about Leia. And then I would like to see if we can open up for some questions at the end. Um, I'm going to cover the things that I think are interesting, but I'm more interested in what you think. So I'd like to hear some questions at the end. We'll do about 10 minutes. So maybe as we go through, you can think about the types of questions and thoughts you might have, um, and we'll try and do four or five questions at the end. So, Leia. Um, we're going to talk about a big range of projects today. It's going to be a cross-section through our approach, our process, the working life in the studio, and then diving into a big range of projects. Everything from kind of super kind of analog furniture and, and beautiful objects to technology, both hardware and software, all the way through to experiences and installation. But we're going to start with a short video just introducing the studio. soft start to the talk and just gives you a little hint around some of the things we're going to talk about today. But first, let's talk about the studio. So the breakup and layout and makeup of the studio, we're about 25. So I'm the creative director, then we have senior people across strategy, industrial design, uh, digital design, and then some kind of uh, some architecture. And within those teams, we have engineers, we have um, research people, and basically we combine very multidisciplinary teams. So the teams will be something between three to eight people, depending on the complexity um, and length and challenges in the project. Very young, very international, very dynamic team, um, highly motivated. I think one of the things that characterizes the team is their motivation. You know, they're all super ambitious. They always want to make the project better than anything they've seen before. And when we're allowed to, when we're able to, when projects work in the right way, we, we tend to try and you know, push as much as we can. So in terms of the, uh, the, the, the studio, this is super photoshopped, by the way. Um, it doesn't really look quite like this. Um, it's nowhere near as clean and clear and, and as simple. But basically, 25 of us sit along big, long desks, collaborating, talking, exchanging ideas in an atmosphere of creativity. So we have lots of prototypes, lots of tests, lots of kind of um, failures as well. I think, you know, we'll talk a lot today about projects that in some degree have been successful, either in sales or communication or innovation or IP or patentable and things like that. But also, you know, the studio is a place to fail fast. So, you know, lots of iteration, lots of collaboration to test and to quickly fail. It's obviously a bit of a, a mantra 
to fail quickly, fail first, fail fast, but it's really true. Our process is super iterative. So we have lots and lots of steps in our design process, from sketching, from model making, from rendering. We do a lot of simulations in 3D, and we do a lot of prototyping. And this is a bit of a corporate slide, so I apologize for that. But one thing that's quite important is to understand the cross-section of the studio. So most design agencies, at least in my experience, work in two, two areas. They sort of do the super cool Milan accessories and furniture and lighting, and super kind of lifestyle-y, but quite analog. And then you get agencies that do the strategic work and the deep dives into industrial design and digital design and more of a consultancy model. What Leia does is it brings these two worlds and it puts them together. So we do the soft stuff for the, the kind of Vitras, the Herman Millers, the Fritz Hansens, um, that you might live with for a long time. So a piece of furniture that you might have for, let's say, maybe 10, 15, 20 years. But we also do the really strategic stuff about tech and what's coming next in terms of that technology roadmap and how people are living and behaving for the likes of kind of the Googles and Nikes and Samsungs. So we have those two worlds. But where I thought I would start is um, a project that probably defines that transition between the studio I had under Benjamin Hubert to Leia. The studio was really the, the kind of the communication and the excitement and the coverage first was about materials. So pushing the potential of materials. Lots of designers that you speak to yourselves, I'm sure, do a lot of this kind of work. But we made it our mantra, so material driven. Um, and one of the projects that helped us to be on the on the map, I suppose, was a project that we did um, self-initiated, but in the end with the Design Museum in London, was the idea of taking a table and transforming people's perception of it. So people love tables, you know, they're crafted, timber, and so we took that idea of timber, we made it three millimeters in veneer, and then we corrugated it. So we corrugated it like you do plastic or metal to give it strength and to keep it light, so it's hollow. So it's very, you know, in a way, quite a, a one-dimensional project. Let's make a table lighter and stronger and use less materials. But it epitomized the design process before we set up layer. Material-driven, smartness with materials and construction. This is the ripple table. So the first thing I'm kind of going to go through in the studio is, you know, we talked about these two ends of the spectrum, so we're going to talk first about the softer furniture, lifestyle, accessories, the things you live with for a bit longer, to talk about how we work on those types of projects. Um, as I said, this is one of the ways that we started the studio, one of our passions as well. Um, and we've been lucky enough to work for some very influential brands and forward thinking. And the first project I'll talk about is um, the chair we did for Fritz Hansen. So this was a project, um, and if I just play this, I'll talk at the same time, there's no music, that took um, quite a long time, so three years to make a chair. And typically, this is how we prototype. So we iterate and we change and we modify we upgrade, we, we change the direction, we look at construction and the way you connect things. And when you work with a company like Fritz Hansen, obviously historical Danish furniture brand, um, and particularly in Denmark, culturally, you iterate a lot. So all the fine tuning and all the detailing you pour over. If I'm being completely honest, three years is too long to, de to design and develop a chair like this. But when you're in this world and when you're working with these brands, you end up, it's like a labor of love. I can't tell you this is the world's most commercial project we ever do, but it's a labor of love. And I think having that passion in the studio softens the edges of being a design agency. So this chair was a modular system, you know, legs, seats, plywood seat, and injection molded backrests. So quite simple. But the idea of modularity, so when architects and interior designers 
specify the piece of furniture. They can choose the modules and have an expression they can control. Not a revolution. But for Fritz Hansen, it was an important story to bring the architects and the interior designers into the design process and engage them with the brand and the product more heavily. So basically, um, this is a polycarbonate, slightly transparent, 10% transparent, so it's more glass-like when you see it, because the problem with plastic sometimes is the value perception. So we try to challenge the value perception, elevate the material by combining it with kind of plywood elements, so the seat element being plywood. Then you can choose different backrests, different seats, different leg combinations to essentially tailor the piece of furniture to your expression. So Fritz Hansen, good partner of ours, we work with them quite a lot. We, you know, we obviously pour a lot of time into this process. Um, but as I said, it's a great, honestly, some of it is a great communication tool. Um, everybody loves a chair. Do we need another chair? Have we solved the problem of sitting down a long time ago? Of course. I, th I always think the discussion around do we need another chair is a bit silly. Because I think actually the you know, beautiful labors of love that people fall in, you know, fall in love with and keep for a long time. And yes, there are lots out there. Yes, the market is saturated. Yes, you shouldn't do too many as a designer. But they're great expressions. And actually, when you design products like this, it's a very strange product to design. It's one of those projects, products that you really sit in and surrounds you. There's not many products that really talk about the whole body. So a chair is a really challenging thing. One of the other pieces of furniture was Axel. So this was um, a piece of furniture for a British brand. We don't work with many of them, not, not on our choice, but because manufacturing in the UK is not, not what it was. But Axel was this idea of creating something with a really strong signature, something you could identify from 10, 15 meters away, and then pulling that through into the manufacture, so thinking about recycled materials, die-cast aluminium, recycled plastics, biodegradable plastics, to have something that was super striking, super identifiable, but also had a fluidity and flow to it. So the idea that you can bring that industrial story in, but also you bring the softness and the humanness and the, the gentleness of the curves and shapes. Still technical, high performance. This is a bio plastic. But also, you know, it works very well in softer interior environments. When we design our products, we often design the launch as well. So one thing we've learned through our process is that, obviously, design is a powerful tool. But if you can't communicate a project, if you can't um, translate it to the audience, often it gets lost. So we design installations and exhibitions to heighten the experience of a product even a basic product, like a chair in some extent. So in this story, the story is a manufacturer. So we use the Y-shaped elements that are from the leg, so it's the casting from the leg, to create an environment using mirrors, using structures, to highlight the brand's investment in manufacturing. We mirrored the ends so they became infinite when you looked at them. So really the story about recyclability and infinite use of materials. Um, and there's a short video just to kind of show you some of the details. So, you know, first introduction to a few pieces of furniture that we've worked on. Um, I think 
One of the other reasons we became, um, had a good relationship with brands, because I'm personally very interested in textiles and fashion, despite the fact I wear completely monochrome um, uh, outfits, and it literally is an outfit. I have, you should see my wardrobe, it's all like black, black, black, black, gray, black, black, black, black. Um, but we're really engaged in fashion and textiles in the studio. And we have a good relationship with Moroso the big Italian furniture brand. And when we work on things like this, you know, we fall in love with the way they're made. I think our passion for process and construction also defines us. So this was a project that we looked at. Um, it, I'm sure mo a lot of you here snowboard and ski. We looked at using polyurethane tape to make a waterproof piece of furniture. Super simple idea. But what it gave it is an expression, an identifiable, but still really simple. And we talk about construction and materiality through the project. And I, one recommendation I would always make is form strong relationships with a small group of brands. It's one thing we're really committed to, long-term relationships, because they're easier and they're more fruitful in the end. And the products end up being better as you build that bond. We've worked with Moroso on lots of things, 3D knitting, super smart use of textiles, um, less but more. So less textile, less construction, less material, um, more sustainable. Um, the whole idea of thinking about textiles as, you know, your, you know, your um, Adidas or Nike uh, fly knit, the whole kind of thing translating to a piece of furniture. It's all made in one piece. So no stitching, no sewing, no joining, no labor. All of the textiles completely one cover despite the complexity. So moving on from furniture. So we talked about that sort of soft end. Before, well, as I set up Layer, one of the reasons we changed from Benjamin Hubert to Layer was, if I'm being honest, we were being asked to do too many of the same types of projects. So, so many brands were coming to us asking for a chair, not even giving us an idea of what they wanted, just another chair. And it became very one-dimensional. As I said, it's not my background, furniture. My background is strategy and industrial design. So we wanted to find more challenges. So layer represents more than just a personal point of view. And one thing we decided to do was give back. So about 20, 25% of the studio works on low bono, pro bono, charity-based projects. We stopped doing so much furniture work and basically used some of that time for these projects. So that horrible image was the world of charity collection boxes. OEM, off the shelf, they're all the same, just a different color, and very classic industrial design project. So shape and semantics communicating the nature of the engagement with the product. So the whole idea, sketching, model making, to find a gesture of thanks in a hardware product. So we could have gone digital with this, but the cost and clients weren't really in that place. And basically, the whole thing is about saying thank you. So a nod of thanks in the form of the product. So when you donate some money, you're like, OK, there's a relationship I'm forming with the product. And it stands out. I think the problem you could see before is nothing stands out. So using industrial design to try and differentiate between other things on the market. And this is a very simple example of that. No digital, no strategy really, just form and semantics. Um, and this is basically what they had before, and this is a new one. And actually what happened when this went out into the world, into the wild, which is always a proof, a, a super, super strong test of a, the success of a product, uh, it raised 80% more donations for the cancer charity than the previous product. So, you know, the power of design can engage in an audience more strongly. And so this is one of the turning points from the two studios I talked about. Um, but one of the things I wanted to talk about um, while I was here was, was this sort of other end of the spectrum. So, talking about tech. Now, there are lots of people that do it. There are lots of brands that do it. There's lots of um, people that engage with it. Um, and it's one of those quite complex subjects, particularly in the wearable market. Um, obviously, you know, the, you know the, the, the, the crash of jawbone and the successes of Fitbit, you know, the market has changed a lot in the last 10 years. You know, the boom of 
wearables is probably behind us to an extent until technology changes to allow us to do smaller, more integrated, more subtle products. So when a tech brand comes to us, we like to find something that is truly ownable and that differentiates them. So this project, um, it's not for a brand you've probably ever heard of. But I'm sure lots of you in here are sports fans. So if you've ever watched Galatasaray or Fenerbahce, then you probably notice on the back of their shirts a little pocket. So right at the top, a little pocket on the back of the shirts. In that pocket is a bit of tech, uh, GPS, various tracking um, elements. And it's by a brand, pretty much like the, the, the biggest brand in that market is called Catapult. They're actually an Australian brand. And they provide this little product like B2B, so they sell it into professional teams. Um, it's, it's super horrible, it's really ugly, it's got a big button on it, but it performs extremely well. So they approached us and said, okay, we've got this really great system, we've got this very smart product, um, and it allows them to track movement, speed, distance, collisions and impact, coverage of the pitch, um, and player load, basically how a player is performing. It's, it's super, super smart. So they came to us and said, okay, look, we've got this quite ugly, um, broke, slightly broken technical system working with professional teams. Can you help us create a consumer product? And, we, and create a brand. So this is player is the brand. Catapult is like the mothership that kind of controls it. So this project and this product um, was born, I guess we worked on this for about 14 months, quite a quick tech project, but completely re-engineered the product. So basically, this product is an induction charging tray and a little bit of tech. It's about, it's about this big, something like that, so about 50 or 60 millimeters by about 30 or 40, so super, super small. Um, and one of the challenges was finding a language that was simple and approachable, but also strong and athletic. So the whole idea here was about kind of softly um, muscular. So this idea of having something that, you know, has an angularity to it, has almost a feeling of aggression to it, but it's still quite neutral. You know, sports and competitiveness need to be kind of portrayed through wearable tech in this area. And actually, it's a little different to some of our other work. You'll, you'll see that most of our other work is a little bit more neutral, a little bit more lifestyle, a little bit more based on pure geometry. But basically, that wasn't suitable for this product. And we're very conscious of the partners that come to us that we work extremely closely with them. So we understand what they want, what their needs are, their brand values, and we try and translate that. So it's not how we used to work, where it was sort of like my personality stamped on a product. This is very much pulling the personality out of the brand and the type of people using it. So this um, product is um, uh, also, we did the branding. I was wondering what, that, what was coming then. I was like, why is there a blank paper? And there's the, there's the branding. Um, so we did the branding, the same thing, softly af um, aggressive, but, but also super kind of neutral and controlled and very kind of modernist in its um, typeface selection. Um, but this product, it's not it's so easy to see it, um, is for aspiring football players. So what you can also do is benchmark your game against the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo or Messi, and you can see how they're performing and then see basically how badly you're performing and like how you might you know, one day get to that level. So this product was a 3D knitted vest that we created. Again, we work a lot in 3D knitting all through the world. Super minimal, really lightweight, takes the heat from the body and has the pocket integrated in the back. And obviously, as part of the, the, the process, I think, you know, when you create tech, Obviously, one of the most important, if not the most important thing, is the service that you provide around it. So very quickly, we understood that we had to build a department on digital. So UI, UX, um, 
front-end developers, a little bit of back-end development, to basically create things like this, apps that would allow us to create a service that would accentuate and elevate the hardware. I mean, hardware is very secondary in this area. So, for example, it's super high contrast, because you often use it outside when you're playing, um, you know, but it's still quite minimal in terms of comparing pitch coverage, looking at your stats and comparing against two people, your friends in a bar after you play a game, for example. Um, and the whole thing was wrapped up in this very minimal aesthetic, but still quite powerful from a high contrast sports language. So this is like, this is, it was a very interesting project. Interesting to think about essentially sort of 14, 15 year old, often guys, um, because the nature of the sport is more guys are engaged with this. Um, so it's very interesting. We had lots of consumer groups coming into the studio, pulling out what they wanted, their needs, their desires, their frustrations, and trying to glean as much information as we could to create a product that would kind of resonate with them. This went out into the market earlier this year, and it's, it's been selling really, really well. Um, uh, and it's also completely available if anyone is, uh, plays football here as well. Um, so, oh, that's, that's me. Uh, to keep on this tech theme, I'd like to talk about, you know, that was slightly traditional tech product, probably. You know, it was plastic with an LED through it. You know, maybe the app design was a little conventional. You know, there's a territory there we, you know, we had to operate in. But generally, when we create tech, we like to bring the material and softness and lifestyle word of the furniture and accessories we work on that we talked about earlier into the tech world. So... We worked with a brand called Trove as a startup. We do work with startups as well as bigger brands to create a product that would help people understand and manage their cryptocurrency. So, pretty complex subject, um, to be honest. Um, and even when we launched it, lots of people still needed to, you know, we need to explain what the product was. But basically, the frustrations around tech is they look too techy. You know, tech should be in it should be an enabler, should be a functionality. I don't believe it should be a visual expression in most contexts. I don't believe you should see how techy something is, but you should feel the performance of it. So this product is a wearable. It, you can wear it in lots of different positions, on your wrist, on your lapel, as a piece of jewelry. And essentially, it looks to have your, your key your kind of passcode to, end, to use your cryptocurrency as ECG. So you touch it and it takes the rhythm of your heart, which is even more individual than your eyes or your fingerprint, and has something that you, you and only you can access. So that's the sort of technology behind it. Um, the product, though, one of the most interesting things about the piece of hardware was the material exploration. So obviously, most tech ends up being injection molded plastic, maybe a little bit of metal for obvious cost and mass production uh, reasons. But the brand that we worked with wanted us to challenge that. So we looked at natural materials. We, looked at, we worked with Quadrat, the textile brand, quite a lot, very tactile textile. We looked at kind of ceramics, volcanic stones, um, various different terrazzos, you know, use of translucent plastics, again, to give depth and quality to it. To essentially create something that would be more disruptive, you know, super simple, very minimal, quite modernist in its language, you know, a line and a circle. But from volcanic rock, use of quadrat textile, so basically you touch between this, it's broken up with a line which breaks the contact in the middle, so I can touch it and it takes my ECG reading, but it's super tactile visually. I want to touch it, I want to pick it up, I want to use it because of the visual tactility. I think, you know, you obviously consume things first with your eyes and then you touch them, so I'm a big advocate of visual tactility. So this product, obviously super simple loop, you can adjust it and wear it in various places on your body, but is rooted in purity and rooted in geometry and I sort of believe that you have to bring the market with you on a new product. So if you change everything, shape, materials, interaction, service, functionality, it always alienates the market. So for example, in this, our shape is super neutral. Like, 
you know, you see, it's, it's basically a watch format. So we, we don't change the shape, but we change the materiality. So people can understand it more readily. It's something we've learned through the design process that if you're too radical, you end up alienating your audience. So we like to basically bring people into the design process and create products that are easy, easy to understand, obviously, intuitive, but also not scary. So, you know, everything from the buckle and the back and all of the textile use, super controlled, super minimal, but very expressive in its materiality. Um, also designed the app for this as well. So again, this was about softness. So of course it's talking about, it's, you know, fintech. It's financial technology. It's a complex subject like cryptocurrency, you know, managing you know, Ether or Bitcoin or whatever you might have. But visually, we wanted to bring softness and, you know, a sensitivity to the subject. So without it being hard and numerical and very kind of overtly data-driven, it's soft and inviting, use of pastels and colors that would allow you to kind of engage with it more from a consumer level. So again, kind of wrapping um, the service around the piece of hardware. Um, it actually charges as well, so it's induction charging, it charges in a cradle that is made of volcanic rock, so the whole thing is, you know, again, really expressive, something that you would be happy to put in your home, to put by your bed, to put by your sofa. You know, technology that is around the home should feel like the home. Um, and I think it's a big thing that we've been an advocate of over the last few years. You remove this element and then can place it from a modularity perspective on different parts of your body, magnetic, etc. So you can place it as a piece of jewelry. I think the overlap between jewelry and tech is very interesting from a semantic point of view, but also gives you freedom in terms of materiality. Okay, so a couple of kind of wearable tech products. One slightly more traditional in the kind of sports, you know, health area. Another in the fintech space with the use of materiality. And what I'd like to talk about next is the brand that I mentioned in the beginning. So the other brand that I'm involved with is Noli. So I'm a, a founder and a creative director of this brand. And in a way, it combines some of the experience of working on small tech products, and again, the lifestyle play, to create a suite of products that are simple, intuitive, but actually solve all the really annoying problems people have with their tech. So obviously, your laptop and your phone are, and to an extent, maybe your desktop computer, like, are crucial to our lives. They are almost the center of our lives. Maybe not rightfully so, but that's a completely different discussion. Um, but it's all the other things that fail us. The cables, the batteries, storing, moving data. You know, I'm sure how many, you know, Apple cables have you been through? They always break at the end. It's super annoying. I've been through like, you know, whatever, 10, 12 cables. So we wanted to create a brand, a set of products, a way of communicating that would solve all the annoying little problems you have that basically stop your crucial tech from working really well. So Noli is a hardware um, startup from London. Big range of products. I'm going to show you four, no, it's about six products, I think, and talk about how each product has a strong visual identifier, but also crucially solves a functional problem. Um, you know, one thing we do a lot is um, we brand products. So we branded this as well. So it expresses the simplicity and intuitiveness of the products. Um, and you, maybe you've seen a lot of these watercolors um, on social media, etc. But again, one of the things we like to do early in the process is use unconventional tools. So in a way, when you use something that hasn't got a very high fidelity, you know, it's not a very small pencil, pen, digital tools where you can control everything, it helps you to create simpler products. So a simple line, a soft loop, an expressive block, but we use watercolors, and, and we do actually paint them. Just, you know, we use some digital tools to combine them, but we paint them in the studio. 
I'm not going to say all we do is painting in the studio, because that would be an exaggeration. But we like to use some of these processes to really create expressive products that aren't over-designed. So we end up creating a range of products, super simple, very minimal, clean geometry, color is very important to us, again, using that painting technique, like watercolors, to define different colors. To uh, basically, let's see what this slide is. Um, this is a new presentation, by the way. Um, I've just put, I just put it together for this talk. So if you end up seeing a black page, um, it's, uh, it's, it's surprising me as well. Um, but we do a lot of prototyping in the process. So you know, we would take those sketches and, and those first thoughts, and we would prototype, prototype, prototype. And this project is a really good example of working with China. So I'm a massive advocate of China. I think China has some of the best factories, technology, and expertise in the world. You just have to be careful around which factories you choose. But this is a project where we took it all the way through from that first conversation with the company, all the way through to visiting the factories, basically living in the factories, and having a designer from the studio working with the engineers, uh, with the business people as well, to basically create all the tooling and all the testing of the product. So super in-depth. The Noli project is about two years. We've just started selling the first projects. Two years is quite a short amount of time for these, this many products. But the suite of products was SET. So SET is a battery and a range of plugs, EU, US, UK that basically magnetize to the battery underneath. So the insight is when I'm out, maybe I want a battery. But I also might want a plug to plug in and charge the battery. But I also might want to charge my phone. So it's got, my, it's got an integrated cable at the bottom. It's got ports to be able to charge from further away. International, because we all live a much more global life in terms of connectors. And also quite expressive and quite characterful and quite happy as a piece of technology, which I think is important. Tech could be a bit too serious, I think. So basically, you interchange these kind of things, and you know, when I got back to the hotel, I can plug the whole product in. I can plug the, the plug, the battery, the plug charges the battery. I can then charge my phone from the same thing, and I can also plug in another device, all from one product. You know, my life, I've got like, like loads of different plugs, loads of different batteries, loads of different cables, and the whole thing was about simplifying the approach. Keep, super small, like a Swiss army knife for tech, has a bit of data in there, has a battery in there, has the ability to find your phone or find Keep. A little bit like Tile, but basically combining lots of disparate technology into one product, so you don't need to carry many things with you. Then uh, Couple, the idea of one simple mechanism I won't say we're the first to ever invent a mechanism on the back of a phone, but this is the idea around engineering a patented connection detail to essentially combine different functional elements. So a battery if I choose to one day, a small wallet if I want that, a car dock, a bike dock, your running band, all from one patented mechanism, but super minimal. It doesn't look like a mechanism. It hasn't got teeth and bits that grip. It looks like a super simple visual expression. Bundle the idea of a loop. Putting a loop in a cable to allow you to have something that stands on your bedside table and doesn't slip off, but also using the loop of bundle to bundle it. Its namesake allows you to roll it up and combine it into one product. So that one loop, which also stops the cable breaking, back on that insight around Apple cables breaking, to kind of con so solve different problems, but still with one clear and clean visual cue. Uh, Rise. Rise is a product we just launched, and this is Noli's move into lifestyle a little bit more. So Rise is, again, super minimal lamp you might love to have at home, so it has an expression that is a bit anti-tech, but it includes lots of technological functionality. The ability to control a digital sunrise, so when you wake up, you wake up to light. It pairs with, with various other smart products in your home. It's made of blown glass, so it still feels very lifestyle. 
or its materiality, but I can charge my device on the top of it. It has a battery inside it, so I can move this anywhere I choose, in the home or outside. And if I want to, I can charge my phone. But if I don't charge my phone, then it still looks like a nice lamp. And I think the idea of like, you know, tech should be invisible and it should be integrated and shouldn't be the visual expression. And like I said before, when we um, launch products, we launch in exhibitions. So this was an installation we worked on at Somerset House in London. Well, we wanted to create something emotive and evocative to basically focus the attention on the Noli launch. So this was 2,000 elements coming from the room, the wall. And then we rotated a light source very, very slowly. And basically all of the shadows softly moved. Very simple idea. But people stopped, they stayed, they took photos, and then we integrated the branding in it as well and focused on the products. So I believe installations and physicality can bring these products to life. Um, in terms of the kind of tech meets lifestyle and meets fashion in this story, we worked with a London brand called Kite to bring a technology I'm going to talk about in another product to the world of eyewear. So this project was about 3D scanning. So the ability to 3D scan a face, have data points on the face, and then create a made-to-measure, perfect fit, and perfect visual expression of the user. So it measures a few things. Pupil distance, nose shape, cheekbones, the width of your head, to your ear, and so all the different dimensions that essentially help you to have eyewear that fits. Like, I, I always struggle. I've got very narrow temples. I always struggle with eyewear. So we wanted to create a system that could create a piece of eyewear that could be 3D printed, made just for you, to your size, but also it allows you to control the shape of the bottom of the eyewear, to match your cheekbones. So using technology as an enabler to create a better product individually for the consumer that brings them into the design process, and basically no one else can have the same product, vesting them in the process. You then dye the 3D print. The 3D print is dyed. There's only one place in the world you can do this. So the color is inherent. If you ever scratch it, it's all the way through. Made from nylon. Um, and then just a very clean visual signature. Very minimal, quite, again, quite neutral, sort of a little bit for everybody, not, not trying to stamp style on it, but allow people to have something that could be that very classic Wayfarer-style eyewear. But of course, it needs detailing. And one insight we are interested in is the nose pads are silicon. They stand the eyewear just off of the face. They reduce sweat. And all of these elements, these modules, can be changed. Color, material, finish. Again, to build a set of eyewear that meets your physicality and your ergonomics, but also your sense of style. So the other element to this is you can then tailor it to maybe what you're doing. So if you play sports, if you play basketball, then you can have the sports band on the back. If you want to keep your eyewear around your neck, you have the reading band on the back. If you want to have a temple tip, which you can fine tune in terms of how it fits you, you choose this version. So basically all wrapping up a system of functionality and visuals that meets the needs of every individual. So the complete range, many colors, many finishes, use of 3D knitting again for that band. And again, wrapping it up in an installation. So this is a data-driven project and product. You know, data is driving the geometry of the product. So if data is driving the geometry, it should also drive the installation. So it's a bit more exhibition-y, this one. But using data to kind of, these are all varied, and they all move, and they all show the eyewear. So lots of facets of material that basically could display and move and be interchanged. So a flexible retail system to show the eyewear. So talking about combining technology 
3D scanning, 3D printing, but maybe now with even more visceral need. So this is a project that we worked on for a couple of years with Nike. Um, we then licensed the technology to a medical company. So what we try and do in projects is find IP that is ownable, licensable, and creates inherent value in a project so that then the brand can leverage this and they aren't copied so readily. So Go is a made-to-measure 3D printed wheelchair. Um, essentially, the insight is that most wheelchairs don't fit users very well. There is movement, they're very arcane, they're kind of things, uh, tubes that are welded and shut, and you know, the, the whole process is, is very old-fashioned. And what happens is you get pain points. So the insight was, what if we could sit somebody in foam with a plaster cover, very thin, that plaster cover could then be used to 3D scan the body. This is in under consultation with a GP. That, those parts can be made anywhere. Super analog, very cheap. You then send those parts to 3D scanning facilities and you generate the data. So this is a slightly explicit um, uh, plaster cast. But what happens in this process is this plaster cast is then 3D scanned. So it's 3D scanned and the data is captured um, and then it's translated into three-dimensionality, which drives the geometry through an algorithm to create the seat element of the chair. So this seat element is 3D printed from the geometry of the plaster to create something that fits better, is lighter, more comfortable, and is more individual to the user. The consumer then uses the app to specify other components, you know, some things that are less based on the, any um, physicality difficulties, so more style-based, and then wrapped up in an aesthetic that's, if I'm being honest, it's a little bit more extreme than most of the language I've showed you today. But this came from the consumer groups and the user groups. A need for movement of dynamism, the sense this would move and go somewhere, but also a language that feels more connected to the body, sinuous structures. So lots of user groups, lots of testing, lots of interviews. And this product is um, a high-performance everyday wheelchair. It's not a sports wheelchair. It's also not maybe your first wheelchair. It's positioned towards kind of the mid to high end of the market, but not right at the top, importantly. And it was a modular set of parts, the 3D printed seat, a titanium frame, and then some carbon spokes on the wheels. So basically, you create a, a move, sense of movement and a sense of emotion on a product that is highly stigmatized. Design is not used as it could be, I think, to create something with much more desire, but with functional benefits. The 3D print has also got some kind of give to it, so it's got inherent suspension in the material, again, for that comfort play. And then every element is considered. So all the touch points, all the breaks, all of the elements you work on are super clean and accessible from a usability point of view. The other element, it won't surprise you as we worked with Nike on this, the other element we talked about was the gloves. So the use of Nike's technology in breathable, um, sweat wicking, sweat taking materials to find a set of gloves you can see super ugly, super weird, quite neutral in the end, that have a silicon screen print on the palm. So this silicon screen print is something that allows you to grip the wheels. So there's an overmolded TPU rubber rim, that, so when you push them, all your power is converted to movement. So again, less strain on the shoulders. It's a short video just to show the product.
Okay, so we've been through quite a lot of products today. Furniture, accessories, tech, uh, apps, uh, mobility. Um, but always the, the, the project I finish on last is probably the most unusual. But depending on your point of view, um, potentially the most impactful from a visual point of view. I think the last wheelchair project is impactful from a usability and user perspective. But one thing we do is obviously we work with lots of brands. Lots of brands have lots of values and they have lots of products. And we worked on a project with Braun, the, um, obviously the shaver brand, essentially, do other, lots of other things, watches, etc., to celebrate a component. So they came to us and they said, we're launching a new product. And we're like, great, that sounds really exciting. But actually what they were launching was a different metal finish on the foil of their shaver. So not the world's most exciting thing, right? The rest of the product looked the same as what came before. But, you know, as they're so super precise Germans in, in Braun, they were like, the foil is the most important bit. It's the thing that's really incredible. But obviously, for engineers, that's super cool. But I'm not sure anyone else really engages with that subject. So we're like, okay, fine. That's a great innovation. But let's celebrate that. Let's take this foil. And what happens if we made it 25 meters? to celebrate this piece of engineering. It's covered in lots of holes in different shapes. The metal is super innovative. It expresses when you move it around your face, this three-dimensionality in the holes, and, you know, that's something I'm very proud of, and it performs amazingly. So, I said, okay, we're gonna create a activation for the product. An activation in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London that celebrates this new innovation. So, we started the process of creating our 25-meter foil from 50,000 mirror finish tiles to represent all those holes, hand-glued, believe it or not, onto a neoprene sheet. This neoprene sheet, and you can see all the tiles here, you know, the gluing wasn't the problem. It was pulling the labels off the mirrors. That was the real problem. So 50,000 labels we had to pull off. Um, the team hated me at the end. Um, we mounted it onto a mechanism, a mechanism that could express the movement of the shaver. So this three-dimensional movement in this kind of foil element. There you go, there's, there's the stickers for you. And then we obviously peeled all of these off of all of these tiles. You can see the neoprene there. And the important thing is that the hard elements, the tiles, because it's got the neoprene in the middle, it's a living hinge. So they all move slightly independently because they're mounted on the textile. So rather than taking you through the images, what I always think is important in this project is just playing the video. Um, so the video is set in the tapestry gallery of the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's super dark. There's very beautiful tapestries on the wall. We want to do two things, celebrate this foil and celebrate the tapestries. So, what this is, is the 25 meter foil. The foil is hit with 10 LEDs, and that foil is moving. So each one of those tiles is moving independently, and as the LEDs hit it, as the light hits it, it basically takes that pattern of that foil, and then it expands it. So all of that pattern and all of the kind of the, the materiality and the lighting effect brings the movement of the shaver to life. So every single bit is completely independent because it's mounted on textile, just like all those holes in the foil were independently different. So this lived in the tapestry gallery for about six weeks during London Design Festival to celebrate the brand, the material and component innovation, but has one small-ish element that creates a very big effect. So in the words of Dieter Rams, you know, less is more. So a smaller element creating more effect was one of our mantras in the project. And again, what was really interesting is people stopped, they stayed, they obviously captured it in social media and talked about the brand in a way that Braun has never expressed itself before. 
So, that's been a big cross-section through the work of Leia, through some of my beliefs about design, through a range of typologies from furniture to tech to service to installation to hopefully communicate our kind of beliefs and mantra in design. So I don't know how much time we've got, but hopefully we can have a couple of questions. But thank you so much for listening. So maybe what we can have is some hands. Has anyone got any questions? And yeah. if someone with a microphone is nearby <laughs> anybody, we can do is maybe two working? or three quick yeah, okay. questions. So yeah, I'm here, right here. <laughs> well, yeah. Ah, thanks. So yeah, as designers, we have a great potential to create solutions. And like, we are all trying to create sustainable systems to uh, create a better world. And like, uh, so I want to know, like, I, what, from what I understood, layer design uh, has an anthropocentric approach towards problems. And so what are some uh, social and environmental trends that you can foresee? And like, are consumers becoming more uh, conscious or less conscious? What do you think? A uh, big question. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, Oh, well, firstly, I don't believe that sustainability is a trend. Um, and anybody that talks about that in that way, I think it's a very good question. But I think it's, um, uh, you know, when brands talk about sustainability as a trend, I think they miss the big picture. You know, sustainability is fundamental. Um, and I think consumers understand it much more now as well. Um, and in a way, you know, the craftsmanship and making of a product, we have people at Apple to thank for some of that, for communicating how products are made. I'm not saying their products are the most sustainable ever, but there's been an education piece which has happened there, which I think is, is incredible. But can, I, I agree with you, and I, I think your, your question is very apt, that consumers are making better decisions. I think, obviously, we have the ability to choose many, between many, many things. It doesn't matter where we are in the world. We have the accessibility of at least seeing all the options. So I think you know, brands have to work harder to get a consumer to buy the product that they produce. Um, and I think one of the ways it's really important to do that is bring the consumer into the process. So that customization, individuality, having something made just for them, I think is one of the ways of engaging that audience. Um, but it's not a perfect world, clearly. You know, there's too much stuff, and you know, things need to be rationalized, and legislation is really the only way that that's going to change. Thank you. Anybody else? We've got one down the front here, if we can get a microphone. Or one here, yeah, we'll come there afterwards. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming here. It was a presentation that I really enjoyed. Uh, my question is, uh, if I didn't understand it wrong, you have like layer and Noel, and layer is like you're working with cli like clients come to you for a specific like like they have, either have something in mind or whatever. What with Noel, you are more free, and hmm. if that, I mean, that's what I thought uh, understood because you said it was a uh, like a technological startup. What I'm wondering is like how does that like difference affect your experience in design? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, Noli started as a client project. The, the guy, the entrepreneur, Assad, that founded it came to us and, and it started as a, um, a person, you know, maybe brand, even though the brand wasn't born, and design agency relationship. It was later they wanted to bring us in as creative directors and, and we had some equity in the company and things like that. So um, I don't know if it changed anything too fundamentally. We're a bit more vested in the company. So our, the interests of success are even more deeply rooted, but actually it makes no difference from a quality solving, pro, uh, solving problems. Um, we just have a little bit more control in the process. So we have more decisions that we can control. But actually, you know, the process is very, very similar. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe let's do one more. Have we had one down here. Sorry. I'm just like here, just this part of the room. Your eyes are very much 
only you know upper parts. That's why you don't see me. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no, joking. Thanks very much. A thrilling presentation. I enjoyed it a lot, and I I am thrilled myself to see how how you've done so much in a very short period of time. My question is. When I look at you, I can see, you know, I guess this is a successful, in terms of business, also a successful project, right? So, but I can still see the artisan in you. <laughs> so my question is very specific, actually. How do you balance, because you've been through legal, you know, financing, everything, right? From scratch, I can imagine the workload you have to handle. Mm -hmm a lot of different types mm -hmm. of works all together. How do you balance mm -hmm. the creator, the artisan, or the thinker with, with the business, the businessman mm -hmm. in you? Thanks very much. It's a very good question. It's, um, it's a work in progress. <laughs> but um, I think you, you, trusting people and letting go, I think, is something I've had to learn to do. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm a designer, and I'm trained as a designer, and so there's a part of me who wants to do all the design work, every single little bit of the process. But I've realized one of the most important things is just key decisions at the right moment. Quite a lot in the beginning, and that key kind of ch challenging moments in the, pro in the project. Very lucky to have a very good team. Uh, very lucky to have a very engaged team and um, that kind of share the passion for the projects. Um, but I believe good design is good business. So if you can connect the two on both sides, from a brand side and from an agency side, it should work for all parties. I think you know, as a designer, as an agency, there should be some financial benefit. But most importantly, if you create a good, part of, good piece of design, it should meaningfully create business for the brand that we work with. So I think it's crucial to be able to think in business and more traditional creativity terms at the same time. Otherwise, you just sort of create products that are for you. Um, and the artisan maybe comes before anything else, but we're not artists, we're designers. And I think designers solve problems, and one of the biggest problems for the brands that come with us is being able to grow, being able to prosper. And so that is you know, really up there with the other priorities. No. Okay, maybe I can try again. All right, so you said that your family introduced you to art uh, since you were a kid, right? And I wonder what kind of branch of art makes you trigger your creativity. And if you're listening to music uh, while you're creating something, what is the genre? Hmm. Good question. Nice one to finish on as well. Um, uh, well, firstly, I love music. Um, I think in another life, I'd have liked to create music. Um, and we have a music a lot in the studio, so I'm, I'm a big fan of like, there's a bit of a headphone culture, you know what it's like in design studios. Um, but we always have loud music, it does tend to be quite electronic. So, you know, it's a bit of a cliche designer answer, but there is always like a 4-4 four, four beat in the background. Um, but I just, I just think that, you know, wrapping yourself in all expressions of creativity is the way to, to find, you know, things that are engaging, things that are maybe a little different to how other people have have done it, but um, you know, I said we're not artists, and that was a bit of a black and white answer. Um, but I believe that you know, any medium of creativity that engages people, solves problems, and, and, and makes people smile is, is, is a great thing, and, and, and, and music is a big part of that for me. So thank you very much. Uh, excellent questions. Thanks for your time, um, and thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you. All right.